Good evening. Thank you for braving the weather and coming out. I think you'll be rewarded for your enterprise tonight. Um, I'm Harold Holzer, and I have the privilege of serving as director of Roosevelt House. And we are delighted to be hosting this uh, film and discussion in partnership with the LGBT Social Science and Public Policy Center at Roosevelt House at Hunter, a long name, but we're all affiliated. And also I'm particularly glad because we are, we've launched a Friday night film series, not a regular, sort of an irregular Friday night film series. Uh, this is the second or third we've done. We have uh, one coming up in a couple of weeks, March 2nd, on the Chinese Exclusion Act and its impact in history. So they vary and um, hoping to attract students and the community um, for free films and good discussion. And this is certainly one of those moments. And um, always inspiring to do anything in the home of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. I don't know why every day of current events makes one more nostalgic about Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> Can't imagine what that's all about. But we're you know, aware too, particular, particularly as we, as we get ready to see the film tonight, that um, presidential records are complicated. And um, while FDR created, um, you know, plumbed the depth of American social consciousness and compassion with the New Deal, there were also moments in, in his, um, under his supervision when there, was, uh, there were witch hunts against gay people, uh, both in World War I, when he had authority over the Navy Department, or, well, sort of unofficial authority because... Yeah, um, I'm being heckled already, and I'm being so, <laughs> I'm being being so honest here. Um, um, yeah, he was assistant secretary of the navy, but de facto head of the navy, um, and uh, in World War II as well under Hoover, the beginning of these witch hunts under the name of national security, which are a blot on history, and of course have to be discussed um, along with the good things. So tonight we locate um, the evolution of gay rights in history and by looking at a film and getting some terrific people to talk about it. And um, we invite you to enjoy and enjoy the discussion. Um, I want to introduce the guy who's organized this. And um, we're delighted that Jason King and Donna Shepard are here. You'll meet them later. But this evening was organized by um, my friend Charles Kaiser, who is Associate Director of Hunter's LGBT Social Science Center and is in his second stint as a Grove leader, um, working with students on projects of interest and importance to them, uh, which is a terrific program. Students should investigate that um, for, next, for next semester, for next spring. But Charlie is also uh, a veteran observer of the city. He, was, uh, he started writing for the New York Times while he was still in college. Just walked in and said, I want to be on the New York Times. And I said, OK, I'm sure that still happens. Right. He spent five years as a reporter on the Metro staff covering real estate um, and politics. That's where I first encountered him when I was a political press secretary, and he was a reporter, and we were both very young, and it was 40 and a half years ago. I know, it's depressing in a way. Um, he also covered municipal government at City Hall, uh, covered the environment, criminal justice, and later became a press critic at Newsweek, uh, wrote about media for the Wall Street Journal, and then wrote um, 1968 in America, his first book, published in 1988, and then his acclaimed uh, Bible of the gay rights movement, The Gay Metropolis, which appeared in 1997 and comes out endlessly in new editions and remains uh, a text, not more than a history. It's a, um, 
a call to arms in addition to a look back. Um, his latest book, The Cost of Courage, is about one French family in the resistance during World War II, and it was published two and a half years ago. He's a founder and former president of the New York chapter of the National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association. He's taught journalism at Columbia and Princeton, and um, needless to say, he is in the LGBT Journalists Hall of Fame. He might have been the first inductee for all I know. And now he's in the Roosevelt House Hall of Fame. So please welcome Charlie Kaiser. Thank you very much, Harold. Uh, working with Harold is one of the great privileges of being in Roosevelt House, as well as with Jennifer Rabb, who is the real reason that I got here in the first place. But the two of them are really the reasons I'm here this evening. Um, I did not design the program, but it has the right person on the, in the picture, in the middle, on the front, uh, holding that sign saying, gay is good. That is Frank Kameny, who is, in my opinion, the single most important person in the history of the gay rights movement because he was the first person to challenge the idea that all gay people were psychologically sick. He was the head of the Mattachine Society in Washington at a time when the Mattachine Society, the earliest gay organization, still regularly invited psychiatrists to come to speak to the membership to explain to them why they needed to be treated and changed. And Frank one day sat down and studied the literature and decided it was just garbage in, garbage out. And it was prejudice disguised as science. And he then made it his personal campaign to change America's point of view on this, starting with the Machine Society in Washington to get it, had them adopt a resolution saying just because we're gay doesn't mean we're sick. And then he did the same thing in New York. And then he was one of the crucial people who convinced the American Psychiatric Association in 1973 to take homosexuality off of its list of disorders, which was probably the single most important thing that ever happened to us. And in 1968, he was watching TV, and he saw Stokely Carmichael say, black is beautiful, and Frank said, we need something like that, and invented gay is good. So uh, this movie that you're about to see, I've seen already, and it is a magnificent short lesson in gay liberation organized around popular song, and uh, we also have a terrific panel to talk about it afterwards. So thank you all very much for coming, and without further ado, let us watch the film. A lot to unpack there. Uh, first of all, I have to say to those, we're live streaming this evening, but the uh, people at home were not able to see the movie when we were watching it, but they can now go to CNN.go and watch it uh, there. We have a terrific panel here this evening, and uh, I think this is one of the most brilliantly edited movies I've ever seen, and that's why we have with us Donna Shepard, who is an award-winning editor whose work has appeared on A&E and, &E and Bravo and VH1. She's been editing films for 20 years, including the Emmy Award-winning 10-part series Carrier for PBS, six-part series Cir Circus for PBS, the Emmy Award-winning Bravo series, Kathy Griffin, My Life on the D-List, Sound Breaking, on and on, and she is on the editing faculty of SVA's MFA Social Documentary Film Program. Uh, Jason King was my favorite uh, talking head in this movie, so we had to have him here this evening. He's an associate professor, director of global studies, and director of writing history and emergent media studies, and the founding faculty member at New York University's Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music. He's a journalist, he's a musician, he's a DJ, he's a producer, he's an author, and I'm told he's making a movie about Sylvester. Is that true? Working on it. All right. Tell us a little bit why you say in this movie that Sylvester is the most important black cultural figure of, what did you say in there? Uh, I, well, I, I can restate it. I, I, I just think Sylvester is one of the, um, if not the most important African-American LGBT icon in popular culture of the 20th century, for sure. Um, you know, he just had such an interesting journey um, from his early days in the Bay Area where he was doing a kind of rock-influenced music, working with acts like the uh, Pointer Sisters and so on. He fronted his own band called Sylvester and the Hot Band with white musicians. 
including uh, Neil Sean, who later go on to Journey, and him as the head of this band, um, you know, as an out black gay person, also very feminine, in, in embracing the femme aspects of who he was, makeup, part of that whole glam scene, but it never really hit for him until disco was invented. And then in the context of disco, he really rose to the top and he had 24 um, uh, hits on the charts. So it's not just like one or two, it's a lot. He was named Billboard's best dis uh, dance artist uh, in 1979, I think, which is at the height of the disco movement. And um, the work that he did is just so powerful, so profound, so complex musically, sonically, culturally, and I think he's been underappreciated. And so I will shout his name as loud as I can anytime I can. <laughs> Donna, what uh, surprised you the most when you, what, what did you learn that the most surprised you when you were editing this movie? I actually think it was a, a, a bite from your interview um, that when uh, you talked about how the birth control pill was hugely responsible for gay rights. I had not really thought of that before. It didn't occur to me. So that was, that was probably the biggest surprise for me. And I hope you all have uh, questions very shortly because we're going to open it up very quickly. Uh, to me, one of the most powerful parts about the movie, of course, is about the AIDS crisis. And I have always said that AIDS was the worst thing and the best thing that happened to the gay community, the worst thing for the obvious reason that half of my generation was wiped out. And the best thing was because it finally provided the impetus that we needed to be as organized as we should have been all along. Uh, Chris Rock in his new comedy special on Netflix says, Trump could work out. This could work out. And then he explains himself that it, we needed to go through the George Bush experience in order to get the tremendous gift of Barack Obama. So I'm hoping that uh, Trump is going to give us the same kind of gift long term. But I also think there are real parallels between the school shootings and the AIDS epidemic, because for some reason, on the left, in my lifetime, it has only been life and death issues that have really motivated us as much as we should be motivated. And I see that happening right now in Florida with these incredibly moving young people. And I hope that this is going to create vast organizational energy. But, but it's unfortunate that we have to be so reactionary in terms of it's our politics. Terrible. It's Because terrible. we can organize, we can, you know, uh, transform these institutions without having to wait for them to create these sort of traumatic, um, you know, experiences that uh, limit all of our options and freedom and so on. So we, we can be proactive about these things as well. And that takes, you know, looking at the history of political organizing and figuring out how to do these things maybe in a more proactive way. It's the big difference. It's the reason that we are where we are today is because the right wing has been proactive and done all those things and been organizing and been spending the money while we have been doing very, very little. So yeah, I think this is the one way that we have to emulate the right wing is that we have to be more organizationally. Directed. But I think it is always a reaction. I mean, for, for me, I think um, it was somewhat comfortable after gay marriage. Like, we're right. like, we've arrived, right. whether we wanted to get married or not. And then we were comfortable with it. And I think a little too comfortable. We were comfortable with that incremental change. And then along comes Donald Trump, and we realized that we, we were too comfortable, I think. I mean, I think part of what's also happened is the, the failure of a certain kind of intersectional politics. While I was watching this, as beautifully put together as it is, um, you know, and looking at the history and Rod Stewart and so on, I was thinking about a song that's on a Roberta Flack album from 1969, her first take album on Atlantic, which is her first debut album. It's called The Ballad of Sad Young Men, which was first done by Johnny Mathis and is this song about gay men in a bar, even though it doesn't specifically, well, it uses the word gay, but not in that sense. Mm -hmm. But it is actually about gay men from a bar. Um, uh, it was written for a musical called The Nervous Set. And it appears on her 1969 album. This is before the rise of kind of like politically activist uh, R&B music of the 1970s, which supposedly starts with Marvin Gaye in 1971 and what's going on. But here's a woman, two years before all of that, doing a political album, there's lots of actively political songs on there, including a song about homosexuality, which in live concerts she would go on stage and she would preface it and make a, a, a statement about 
um, the need for Christians in particular to accept gay people. Wow, I had no idea. And this is the issue with history, right? The telling of history, the retelling of history, looking at these intersections between race and sexuality and class and gender. And we have to be able to honor the complexity of the history when we tell it, um, because it's the only way that we can get to a sort of better future. And I think one of the things for me that is sort of has been troubling about the last 10 years or so is that the political agenda, the mainstream political agenda for LGBT people became marriage in the military, right? Like the last 20 years. And that incredibly important, very, very important because those were in some ways oppressive institutions that had to be reformed and changed. But that became the sort of limitation of the agenda. And there wasn't, for instance, uh, uh, the same kind of focus on economic justice or justice for people of color who are disproportionately affected within LGBT communities. So I'm wondering if we can get to a place where we can celebrate our intersectionality as the entry point into a kind of political activity of the future. I think that's, that's how we do affect change as well. Well, and I think if we can't do it in the gay community because we are everyone, we are every part of society, and if we can't do it in the gay community, it's not gonna get done, certainly. And I will say that the biggest fights that we had in the edit room were about Rod Stewart. <laughs> yeah. I, um, when you're putting these kinds of things together, there are all kinds of voices that come in, and part of it has to do with um, who's popular, who's not popular. Um, uh, they went, they went and did an interview with Rod Stewart, and uh, and then there are all kinds of people who are saying Rod Stewart has to go in. No, he's not. Uh, and but if once you do the interview, he kind of has to go in. Uh, but those were our biggest fights, Rod Stewart, certainly. But what was the argument against using him? Um, I think that uh, he's not gay. Right. And uh, even though he was an ally, although not necessarily one through uh, overtly throughout his life, right, right. so I think there were other people that we felt like might be better representation. Uh, the other issue in putting these things together is there is a timeline. So there are tons of gay songs, right? <laughs> and uh, so you have a timeline uh, that you're trying to create in this episode, and songs fit in a certain time, and that might not be the right place for it in that particular act. And so 1969 was a little early for that act that we were talking about. Um, and so all kinds of puzzle pieces have to get put together. I will say that the hardest act to do was to tell um, basically uh, AIDS epidemic in six minutes. Yeah, which was quite an accomplishment. That, that was incredibly hard. I mean, yeah. gay, gay uh, culture and history in 54 minutes, or whatever this is, 52, I don't even know, is hard, but AIDS in six is harder. Well, I think, I think you did as well as anyone could possibly do in that very short period of time. You get the feeling of the oppressiveness of that moment in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. It, it feels yeah. accurate to the time. Right? Yeah. Questions from the audience? Please use the microphone. <laughs> I, 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 first of all, thank you for doing this. It was really entertaining. and I, I was a little surprised there wasn't wasn't more music focused based on on the the way it was described, um, but uh, I certainly appreciated what was there. Uh, I just want to say that I I feel like I wonder if the gay community is is still with us. You know, I, this almost felt like a rise and fall story. You know, and and it, it, it I didn't come away with this at the end of thinking, okay, we've got to really go out in the street and work on this or that or you know, it seems like the agenda has just dissipated. You know, and I look around the room, most of the people here are older. Uh, I'm just, you know, uh, I don't know. This was wondering if you could address that. Thank you. Can I address that sure. a little bit? Um, I, I uh, agree with you. I think right now um, most gay people that I know are working on social justice in general out there. And also my son, who is 14 years old, it doesn't, it, it's like a blip for him, gay rights. Because for him, it's just like gay rights. Like it's equal. It doesn't, in his school, they have gender free bathrooms. They have kids who, uh, they use pronouns they. It's just like, it's so different 
uh, for young people now, I think. Um, that being said, we're in New York. We're not in middle America, so. Oh yeah, that, the struggle continues in so many ways, and I think maybe even um, there's more galvanizing around these issues. Um, certainly in the area of representation, popular culture, and what's happened there, you know, movies like Moonlight and Call Me By Your Name, and uh, you know, even the debates around Black Panther and why are there not more LGBT characters in it. I mean, these are the areas in which these discussions are happening, but also I think there's a lot of, act of political activism that's happening um, in very direct ways, um, and I'm inspired to see how young people have um, engaged these issues. Also must mention trans uh, issues um, have come to the fore in a way that uh, we, we had not seen before, and that's really empowering too. But I do still want to make this um, um, uh, I want to bring to the forefront this need for a kind of intersectional politics, right? I think that's what people really are still trying to figure out how to do, is to bring these issues together. So it's not like, well, first let's talk about racism, and once we get rid of racism, then we'll deal with homophobia, and then once we deal with homophobia, then we can get to class. It doesn't work that way. Because some people are impacted by all of those things at the same time, <clears throat> right? And so what we need to do is to be able to figure out how to address the, what we really want, right, which is, I, I think, a society in which everybody can participate and which is totally inclusive, in which no one's private life has to be repressed for somebody else's benefit. And if we can think about how to get to that place, that means engaging a kind of intersectionality that has been challenging, right, because people might be like, I'm, I'm against homophobia, but I'm not willing to, to deal with my own racism. Or I'm against racism, but I'm not willing to deal with my own homophobia. Et cetera, et cetera. So we, we are not in a space yet, I think, although we're moving that way, where we can really um, have those kinds of uh, nuanced, complicated conversations. And as an historian of the movement, I always have to point out that the gay movement owes everything to the black civil rights movement. The black civil rights movement gave us the explicit template, including, by the way, the integration of the armed forces by Harry Truman. And everything that we have done is because of what was done before us by the black civil rights movement. So this intersectionality has to happen. And, and the black civil rights movement was inspired by anti-colonial movements all over the world, right. and Martin Luther King right. looking at what right. Gandhi was doing. And so these things are all so interrelated and yeah. so complicated. And so we have to good. remember that. And uh, just to your point about uh, the amount of music in this particular episode, um, when you do these shows, you have a budget, and you're limited. Um, all that music is super expensive, and you and uh, and so you're limited mm -hmm. to the number of songs. And I think we are limited to ten songs per episode. So, mm -hmm. boy, hard. Yeah. I know it was it was so hard to choose. <laughs> yeah, the question was about uh, La Caja Full, I Am What I Am, which is a major anthem, 1982, around that time, and then re-recorded as a disco anthem and became huge. But that an anthem of self-affirmation, the message of that song, I think, gets transposed into other songs, including a song like Born This Way, Lady Gaga, which has the same kind of spirit, but actually explicitly addresses the word transgender, for instance, in the lyric. Um, so I think it was incredibly important, but as part of a lineage that moved toward where we are today. Regarding that movie uh, about uh, Sly, I um, guess you're referring to Sly Stone? No, so, no, no, no. Sylvester, the disco artist, not Sly Stone. Okay. Oh, okay. But happy to talk about Sly Stone, yeah. Sly and the Family Stone. We could talk <laughs> okay. about it all day. First multiracial, multigender rock band of the 1960s. Very important. Okay. I'd like some more information about that movie. Uh, it doesn't have to be today. You don't have to give it to me. You can give it after today. So what? Yeah, there's it's definitely wonderful. another conversation. We'll talk about that for sure. Well, I just want to know what went on, uh, when it be available. Yeah. Or will it be shown here? I presume. I presume. Sylvester. I, I'm hoping you know to get this together. So we're trying to work on a Sylvester documentary for sure, and hopefully we can screen it here when, when the time is right. Yeah. But there was a great um, episode from TV One's show, um, and the name is I'm, I'm blanking on the show. Um, unsung. Yeah, unsung. Uh, on Sylvester, which is worth checking out if you can. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, well, just first to comment, another big anthem was uh, Somewhere, which was written with Leonard Bernstein, that, you know, from 
that we really adopted as one of our anthems. And, and then I was going to ask you in the editing, was there a conscious reason not to mention reason not to mention Edie Windsor? It just was time the fact, or you just didn't want to make it a personal? Yeah, it's win? really um, you know there's so many people, and um, and it's also we felt like there's a huge weight on your shoulder in the edit room in trying to tell it truthfully and include as many people as possible. And there's just such a limited time. And the Anita Bryant section just goes on forever. <laughs> that, that being said, that was because we kept, it was shorter and we would send it to CNN and they would be like, what? I can't believe this is happening. That really happened? And so <laughs> we, from the network, we kept having to put in more and more of Anita Bryant because I think it was unbelievable for them. <laughs> and so, you, you know, uh, then that kind of overshadows and takes up timeline real estate from other people. But somewhere, somewhere from West Side Story is a beautiful song, and and, and I think also very, I very I agree a very important anthem for certainly the first Absolutely. one to me when I was eight years old. <laughs> but I, I heard those things. I didn't necessarily. I mean, Anderson Cooper's in in the in the doc in the documentary saying, you know, uh, YMCA. I knew exactly what that was about. I didn't. I definitely <laughs> didn't. I had no idea. I mean, well, he's much I, older than you are. Should be I, not that much. <laughs> I looked up, but um, I had no idea. Or a song like "Somewhere," I did. I didn't particularly know the politics as a kid listening to that, but I certainly figured it out a little bit later. When but, I said that to the creators of West uh, West Side Story, they hated the idea that it was a gay song. They uh, said it was only about pre you know racial prejudice, and nothing to do with the fact that all four of them were gay. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, they're remaking West Side Story, Steven Spielberg and Tony Kushner. So yeah, let's see. Yeah, let's see let's what see happens what now. Happens. Yeah. Let's see how they re <laughs> recontextualize that song. Charles, I wanted to ask you why did the Mattachine Society invite psychiatrists if their words because were so it was negative? The, because it was the assumption of all gay people at the, that they had a disease. Everybody accepted this, that even though they were acting as gay, they were behaving as gay, that the goal, the only way that you could become a healthy person was if you could get beyond your heterosexuality. Most gay people, inter almost all gay people internalized this idea that there was something wrong with them, and therefore they were perfectly willing to listen to psychiatrists at their monthly meeting telling them how they could fix themselves. That's how far we've come. Thanks for bringing me back to uh, the firehouse. I actually danced I was, there. I was there, too, yeah. <laughs> and I stayed at the YMCA. Um, my question is, I thought it was good that you brought out um, about gays and lesbians not really uh, merging till many years. Um, I came to New York in 1976, and my first gay pride, uh, we were walking up Fifth Avenue, and I remember the gay guys went one way and the lesbians went the other way. <laughs> and I kept thinking... Why, if we can't get ourselves together, how are we going to get other people to appreciate us? So I'm glad that you did bring that. That was really the most extraordinary thing about the AIDS epidemic because lesbians, after all, were not physically at risk. And boy, did they ever rise to the occasion and come to our help in every possible way, both organizationally and caregiving and everything else. And it really is the beginning of some degree of unity of the two halves of the movement because of that epidemic. So every single queer person in the world has a song that they personally associate <laughs> with, um, whether it's a coming out song or a song that makes them proud to be queer. Um, out of, without what's in the documentary, what would you say is your personal song that really, when you hear it, you feel proud, you want to stand up and just celebrate? Okay, I'll go first. Um, <laughs> it's actually in the documentary because why wouldn't it be? <laughs> Um, Sylvester, you make me feel mighty real. I played it every morning when I would come in. It makes me happy, um, it, and it gives me hope. And uh, we made this uh, during the election, and when Donald Trump was elected, it was we you know it was really hard uh, for everyone. But um, and that song really helps a lot. 
Uh, for me, the, you know, there was a um, conversation uh, that we did as NP I'm at NPR, so NPR writers, um, after the shooting at Pulse nightclub in Orlando, and we were asked to think about the songs that mattered to us and that, that changed us and so on, related to the idea of the club as a safe space. I don't think clubs are necessarily safe spaces, but they can be in certain kinds of ways, but they've also been challenging spaces for people. But for me, my memory of the club scene back in the early 90s or so um, was uh, You Don't Know Me um, by Armand Van Helden and, um, and Dwayne Harden. And I don't know how many people know that song, and I won't try to sing it right now, but <laughs> it's in that spirit of I am what I am, that sort of thing. Um, and it's a song of affirmation and just being yourself and so on. And I mean, we used to just dance to that song like crazy. So when I hear that, I'm immediately sort of taken back to this place where I was at that moment, um, which is great. And that's the power of popular music, right? To transport you back to these moments. Hmm? Yeah, that's the, that's the lyric of the song. So you don't even know me, so why do you judge my life? Um, and I think that sort of has become a phrase where people say, you don't know me, you don't know my life. Uh -huh. But it sort of you know, is inspired by that song. But that is the power of popular music, to take us back to these moments that changed us, that transformed us, that meant something to us, to sort of beam us back to these moments where we stand in this sort of authority and power and uh, sense of, of who we are. Um, and so that's why I love working in music, because I'm continually connected back to these moments of of who I was and who I am now. Uh, every song on Eli and the 13th Confession by Lauren Yarrow, who was the greatest uh, lesbian singer of her era and talked about, uh, had lyrics about being in love with women and cocaine on the same <laughs> album. And uh, was an incredibly important figure, really the precursor of Lady Gaga in all kinds of ways. And uh, because I am most in love with Bob Dylan, of all popular culture figures, uh, the Chimes of Freedom, because he talks about uh, being, for every hung up person in the whole wide universe. And in fact, Allen Ginsberg, the first time he heard that, said, listen, he's singing for every hung up person in the whole wide universe. Uh, what's yours? It's the queer anthem. <laughs> You're saying Donna Summer, I feel love. Maybe give them the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Anybody else? <laughs> after that. Yeah. What do you do after that? Um, <clears throat> I've I've tried at times to to explain to people who are younger and didn't go through this what the connection between the AIDS crisis and outing was, and. I think if you were there, it seems pretty clear, but if you weren't, clearly less so. Can you guys speak to that a little bit? Roy Cohn certainly never would have come out of the closet if it hadn't been for the AIDS epidemic. He probably never did really anyway, but and obviously Rock Hudson never would have. All the most famous people who came out were forced out because they were visibly ill, and it just it, 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 it made it concrete that we really were everywhere. It's interesting that the first vital book on, this, on the gay subject was called The Homosexual in America. It was published in about 1954. And the author said, if only we could find a way to get everyone to come out at once, it would change the world. Well, obviously, this was the most horrific way to do that, but it did accomplish that to a very large degree. And it just gave the world a sense of our ubiquity, which didn't exist before, because so many people were. Well, that happened, you know, Pete Williams, now the famous NBC News correspondent in the Washington Bureau, was the spokesman for the Department of Defense at the time when gays were not allowed to uh, serve openly, and Michelangelo Signorelli decided that this was an important fact to show because one of the arguments, of course, against this was that we were security risks. 
Um, and that was one that I was extremely in favor of, Pete Williams. Uh, generally speaking, my own position has always been that it's fine to out anyone who is actively working against our interests. So any Republican politician who's voting against us, who's gay, should be brought out of the closet. And in popular music, I mean, I have, I'm writing a, a biography right now of Freddie Mercury, and you know, he was the first um, um, mainstream musician to die of AIDS. I mean, Sylvester and others before him, but kind of mainstream major news item, um, and you know, he uh, you know, only disclosed his HIV status uh, or the fact that he had AIDS uh, the day before he died, right? And so um, it was very, popular music was a space where even though there's so much ambiguity, so much um, androgyny, um, so much gender fluidity and playing with roles, it was not a space where it was comfortable for artists at all to talk about this stuff. But it's interesting, there are these songs about AIDS, there's like uh, Terrence Trent Darby, um, 1989, I think has a song called Billy Don't Fall In Love With Me. He's like, if you have AIDS, I'll take care of you, but please don't fall in love with me. <laughs> so it's like this kind of weird homo panic moment. Um, but this was, this was the tenor of the times, right? That you couldn't even speak about this openly in popular culture. I think we forget how quickly things have changed. It's been like, well, and again, as it says in here, there's movement forward, like jump forward, and then a backlash, always. Um, always. And we have that now. But, but uh, the door is so far open now that I just feel like, Surely not. Surely. <laughs> well, to me, the, you know, what I learned from that time was empathy. Like, I, I learned from Diana, Princess Di, from Elizabeth Taylor, from Michael Jackson singing Gone Too Soon about Ryan White when, you know, they were burning right. homes. Right. I learned a sense of the kind of empathy that was necessary to exist as a thinking, feeling person in the world. I think right now what's missing in the culture is, a set, is like, is, it's like... We need empathy. We need to weaponize empathy. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's yeah. really lacking from every level, um, yeah. you know, of, of, uh, from the administration, institutionally, all the way down. And that's, that's sort of what's challenging about living in this, in yeah. this moment. I agree. Hi, I'm Councilmember Danny Drum. And, um, I'm very interested, this was an excellent job, but I'm very interested in trying to get gay history taught in the public school system. And um, this would fit perfectly in a classroom. And, um, and um, uh, the whole issue, I think, for LGBT youth, uh, uh, still really there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of discrimination against LGBT youth in the public school system. Just today I heard that they need in Queens a, a private place to meet in their school or outside their school to have a GSA in their school. You know, uh, if you look at what happened with Abel Cedeno up in uh, the Bronx, where he had to defend himself by killing the kid who allegedly attacked him and allegedly for bullying, et cetera, so forth and so on, there's still a lot of stuff that's going on in schools. So, one is this available for schools? That's one question. And then, um, you know, the whole issue of intersectionality as well. Um, and then, right, I mean, we have one month for black history, and rarely does that ever get taught. Gay history certainly doesn't get taught at all. What can we do? Because I think that youth really need to know this, what we, sh what we saw here today, and much more. Well, this is on the CNN Go website. So, in fact, it can be seen in any school that has a computer connected to the Internet. Is and there it curriculum with it? Excuse me? Is there a curriculum guide? There's not no, a curriculum guide. No, there isn't, guide. no. Have you thought about working on that, or? Um, <laughs> um, I don't know, I mean, we, we could. have not per se, but we could. Uh, it's a good idea. It's a great idea. It would be great if CNN would do it. Um, <laughs> That's kind of what I was aiming at, you know. I'm, yeah. <laughs> Been working with, with WNET on some of these things as well, yeah. but you know a lot of people do try to access these lessons now by internet, et cetera, so forth and so on. And I think that some teachers are ready to bring it into their classrooms. Um, so and and just let me get my la my pitch in for my favorite song, which was "Ain't Nobody Straight in L.A." by the Miracles, 1975. <laughs> <laughs> Album cut. <laughs> 
We have time for one more question. I was just going to say, I applaud your efforts, by the way, to do this in the schools. That's great. Yeah, That's fantastic. Absolutely. Call John, John Adler at CNN. John Adler. <laughs> All right, one more in the back. Well, I like heavy music selections, but I have to agree that there weren't enough songs for musical theater represented. I mean, considering the connections between the gay community and musical theater, you'd think there would be at least one show tune there, but why not? Judy Garland was there. <laughs> Come on. She, yes, I, I mean, we can all say, like, what wasn't there, but it really, this is a part of a series. It was 42 right? minutes. <laughs> this movie is only 42 minutes. They packed it in. So. Yeah. I mean, it was hard in the beginning because, um, you know, finding a song for Act One was actually really hard. Most of these, the because uh, we've done several of these in the series, we did MLK Assassination, we did 9-11, which you would think would be the hardest one, but it actually was not. Um, and so most of them, Act One song is not hard. Other acts are hard. This one was like impossible. Um, and so uh, the Age of Aquarius was actually, you know, it's a little bit of a stretch, um, but Eliza kind of saved no, us belongs. with that. I think it belongs there, absolutely. Right, so, um, but the idea of hair and that idea of that musical was as far as we yeah, go. Yeah, so we did, we, they, they, they did have a musical, yes, exactly. Good. Right. All right, please give the panel a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very well done.